Today's screencast is how to create a proper graph for science class. Now the first thing that you're going to want to do is decide on what type of graph you want to produce. And that's going to be based on the type of data you have. So let's look at a few different types that are out there. First of all, we could use a line graph and we would use that if we were trying to show how one variable will be changed by another. Let's take a look at a line graph and see how that works. So here we have a line graph and you can see initially data points were plotted and then at the end someone drew a line of best fit through those data points which is absolutely appropriate for a science graph. Now if we take a look and examine the axes, uh, if you guys remember your axes we have the x-axis down here going horizontally and the y-axis going vertically. So on our x x-axis we have the temperature outside it starts at 0 and it goes to all the way up to 140 on the y-axis we have number of UFO sightings that goes from 0 all the way up to 12 so what we can see here is how one factor changes or affects another so as you can see with the temperature outside most of the data points are pretty low except when you get above say 70 degrees we start to see a huge amount of data points exist on the high side so what we can then say is as the temperature is increasing we see an increasing number of UFO sightings so maybe there's some connection there to temperature and the ability for people to look up in the sky to be outside and maybe see some things whereas maybe if the temperature is way down here in these cold temps you have a lot less people outside looking up into the sky so this is an appropriate type of uh, this appropriate data set for representation using a line graph. Now, second type of graph you could use to be a bar graph to show how quantities vary by or with another factor. Okay, so let's take a look at this graph here. It's called a bar chart to show deaths in Europe caused by seven leading risk factors. So here we have a quantity that's changing that's related to a number of different factors. There may or may not be any connection between these factors. So our factors are high blood pressure, high cholesterol, tobacco use, obesity, low fiber diet, physical inactivity, and alcohol abuse. All of those are pretty bad. And all of those unfortunately lead to deaths, which is now on the y-axis. So we can then go ahead and set these up in order by way of looking at their bars as to which ones are the most significant and which ones are the least significant in causing death. So this is an appropriate type of graph you would use when you have um, mostly unrelated categories. They are related, though, through the fact that they're all bad for you, but there's no direct connection between physical activity and low-fiber diet. However, if you ran the numbers, you might find some connection there with another study. The third type of graph we could possibly use is a circle graph, or more uh, commonly known as, as a pie graph, and it's used for showing parts of a whole. So let's say you went out to go clean up a beach, and at the end of your beach cleaning uh, session, you went ahead and you went through all the trash that you found. And what you came up with, after cranking out the numbers, seeing how many pieces of each type that you had, was you had enough data to then change those numbers into percentages. You took each type of trash, divided by the total number of pieces, and that got you these numbers over here. So what we can see is that they color-coded their graph each slice represents a different color, different type of pollution or trash they found on the beach. And then just to make sure that the graph was done well, we can make sure that their numbers add up to an appropriate number. So here we have 40% was cigarettes, 19% styrofoam, that's 59%, plus 16%, so we have 69 plus 6, that's 75%. 15 more percent is paper that makes 90 altogether and then we have wood metal glass cloth rubber and other so we go 93 95 97 98 99 100 so when you do a circle graph or a pie pie graph what you want to do is make sure that your percents do add up to 100 to make sure that you did your work correctly so those are the three types of graphs, and depending on the type of data that you're looking at, you will choose then the best graph to fit your needs.
after picking a graph type in step number one, number two, um, and this is just related to bar and line graphs, is we have to determine what's going to go on the x and what's going to go on the y. So we mentioned a minute ago that it typically will have something to do with the scientific method. Often it does. So what we see here is on your x-axis, this is, remember guys, this is the x and this is the y, we have our independent variable and on the y-axis we have our dependent variable. So the independent variable is going to result in certain things happening and those certain things that happen can be measured and then plotted. So in this case here, our graph is titled the effect the amount of sunlight has on tulip growth. So maybe you had a whole bunch of trials going, some were in the dark, some had low light, medium heat, uh, light, high light. Regardless, the amount of sunlight exposure in this one trial here, from 10 all the way up to 90 hours, will result in a different amount of height of those tulips. So let's say you had a group at 0, a group at 10, 20, 30. Each one then is plotting, we, we will plot a new data point that relates the amount of sunlight to growth. So growth, the average height is dependent, as you can see, on the amount of sunlight that tulip has been exposed to. So make sure that you clearly understand what independent variable and dependent variable are before you assign your axes. Let's examine this graph for independent versus dependent variable. Now, first of all, this is a bar graph, which is okay, we can still do it. And the title of the graph here is the effect nuclear radiation has on bean plants. Now, in the title, that kind of gives away independent and dependent variables. The effect that nuclear radiation, independent variable, I'll put IV over that, has on bean plants. Now, what is the effect on the bean plants? Well, if you look over here on the Y, it's number of plants that died. So the effect on the bean plants is your dependent variable. And unfortunately for the plants, it winds up in their death. So on the x-axis then, we look at the amount of radiation exposure in minutes. And you can see in the various columns, we have zero uh, minutes, five, 10, 15, all the way up to 45. And as we reach 10 minutes of exposure, we start to see plants die. So at 10 minutes and 15 minutes, one plant died in each of those categories. At 20 minutes, two plants died, 25, and the number keeps going up. So it's very similar to a line graph type orientation. And you could do this in a line graph, but they went with a bar graph. But importantly, we're trying to label our independent variable and our dependent variable correctly so we can express that to who's ever looking at our research. Number three, abrupt changes in a graph tells you something significant has happened. So let's take a look at this graph here. It's a little bit different. It's about unit production. Well, who knows of some company producing a certain product X, product Y, and product Z. If we take a look at our two axes, we have the months of the year down here in 2004, and here we have units of product from zero all the way to 9,000 kilograms. And what we're examining these graphs for here is something significant happening. Now, significant is something that draws your eyes to it. It, it. it commands your attention because you're looking at the way the graph is going and suddenly something changes rather abruptly. So for example, let's look at this product Y. We start out at 7,200 kilograms, it drops a little bit, and then all of a sudden it goes way down here, but then right back up. And then after April, we see that this plummets once again and almost goes down uh, to flatlining by November. So that's something significant. And if you were, you know, uh, if you were leading this company and you saw your product Y drop off, you'd have questions that you would have on why is this happening? So something abrupt has been signified. Now with the second case of product X, we have in this case a line that starts out at about 3,000 kilograms and it, there's a slow and steady increase uh, from February forward and then it kind of tapers off and kind of stays at this level. Could the increase be significant? Sure, a little bit. And then lastly, if we take a look at the third graph down here, we can see that it begins in April and there's a slow and steady climb and it kind of does one of these. If we drew a best aligned fit, it would be a nice gradual increase. Um, if we did the same thing for our product X, 
there's a gradual increase in this one as well. And then in the product Y, it's just kind of chaotic. So in this one, product Y is the, has the most abrupt changes and something to really pay attention to. Rule number four, science line graphs should be shown as smooth lines or curves. In other words, don't connect your dots with straight lines, nor use your ruler to draw a straight line from point to point. Instead, we're going to draw what's called a line of best fit. So this line is going to go through most of your data points, but it's going to do so in a very smooth way. And we're going to do this by hand. So what we don't want to see is what we typically call a sawtooth pattern which looks like that, or alligator teeth, you know, the, the jagged up and down motion from point to point. We do not want to see that. So let's take a look at some examples here. So this one, we're clearly showing a curve of best fit versus connecting point to point. If you connected point to point, it would look, whoops, it would look something like this. You'd be going up and down and all over the place on your way down. And it's harder to really isolate the trend when those dots get chaotic. Now this one you could follow, but the curve of uh, best fit, the line of best fit, which is hand drawn, is much easier to understand and interpret. It's nice and smooth on the way down. Okay, let's look at an another couple examples. Here you can see uh, we kind of have some a little bit more um, chaotic dots, but you can see a line of best fit goes right through here and also through here. Those were computer generated. Let's look at another one. Here is uh, some kind of graph showing some data, and now it's starting to get, again, a little bit more chaotic. So how exactly do these lines connect? Um, it might be hard to figure it out. So they're kind of all over the place, but overall, there's gonna be a trend which you can, again, line of best fit, go through the mass of the points with a freehand line. You can see the overall trend there. And um, this one here is another example, and we can see how, you know, back and forth these lines, whoops, back and forth these lines can go with an alligator teeth pattern, but instead, what we really want to get across here is the fact that it's a nice, smooth, gradual increase in those data points. And here's another wild one that has all kinds of um, weird data points. So this one looks like you're going uh, nice and smooth, and then all of a sudden you bounce up here, you go back down, bounce up, and here, and then suddenly, who knows where these things go. But overall, again, a smooth free-handed line kind of goes like that. Rule number five has to do with the title of your graph. The title of your graph is done by no accident. It's a highly calculated set of words that are very meaningful in terms of independent and dependent variable when you're trying to relate your study to the scientific method. And it goes like this. The dependence of, and then whatever your particular dependent variable is, is going to go on that line. So earlier we saw an example of the effect of sunlight on tulip growth. So what we could say for that one is we could go ahead and write in the dependence of tulip growth on the independent variable was sunlight. So that would make for a very succinct statement about what your data is trying to represent. You can also do it in another worded uh, example that kind of just flips that around. So we could say the effect of sunlight, and that puts the independent variable first, on, in this case, it's going to be tulip growth. Here's an example of a proper title for a graph using independent and dependent variable. So this one says, the dependence of tra traffic ticket cost on automobile speed. So this is going to be your dependent variable. This is going to be your independent variable. And as you can see, independent variable is going to be on the x-axis. Dependent variable is going on the y-axis. So as the automobile speed goes up, the cost of the average speeding ticket also increases. Again, here is our data points. We don't do this. Instead, as you see already on the graph, someone has drawn a line through the majority of the data points there. Rule number six is an easy one. Units are always shown on each axis. So 
we always want to not only have what the independent and dependent variable is, but the unit as well. So this one's really easy because it's just year, so that's, you know, there's nothing extra to add here. And here is the value, but it's in dollars. So, you know, in science class, we're going to use things like um, grams, we're going to use things like liters, we're going to use things like meters, so measure distances. Um, but they don't have to be, they can be other things as well. Um, but those are going to be some really common things there, pressure units. Um, solubility is all the things that come in science will typically be found very um, very succinctly explained by way of having a unit with your descriptive term with your measurement term rule number seven data in your graph should fill the page if not rescale your axes so let's imagine that this is a piece of paper, your entire screen here. Sometimes I'll see people in the bottom left-hand corner of their paper, they'll have a graph that's this big in relationship to the rest of the page. You want to fill that page with data. And if you wind up and your data points finish out maybe here, rescale your axes. So if it's going one, two, three, four, five, then maybe go by half. So then one will actually now be here, two will be here, three, four, five, and six. That would make it a lot easier. So by rescaling axes, you're changing the numbers, but you're keeping them constant, of course. Fill the page with data. So all of this space on your whole page should be filled with the coordinates and then the type of graph that you have is line or bar, or it's a circle graph that should really fill the page visually. Number eight, please use a ruler when drawing your axes because it's going to look very sloppy otherwise. So let me give you an example here. This is typical student paper. And the student probably thought, yeah, I'm really sweet at drawing straight lines. I'll just use the lines on the paper. Well, check out their graph. Look how messy this is by freehanding that line. So use a ruler even if you have graph paper and it's going to make the whole thing look nicer. The other thing I noticed was on the x-axis down here, look at how the spaces are not equivalent by freehanding this graph. If you're using a ruler, it's going to make your increments be at an equal distance from each other, which is going to make the graph more accurate as well. For some reason, there's a 1 in between 0 and 5. Well, that's not the case. If it really was placed right, it would be way down here. And then the distance between 0 and 5 is so much bigger than the distance between 15 and 20. We want it to be equivalent. And then over here, of course, same thing. They freehanded the line. It looks terrible. And of course, you want to put out a quality product when you make a graph. And last rule, number nine, use multiple lines and contrasting colors to clearly show the differences of multiple subjects under study. So here we have a graph that says the number of germs present in two milliliters of patient one's blood after a 10 milligram dose of penicillin. So in this case here, we have three germs present, and each one is responding to that dose of penicillin. But to clearly show it, we can see that there's different colors in play here. We have red, purple, and yellow, which distinctly jumps off the page at you, showing you three different subjects are under study here. And you can easily follow them that way. So when you have multiple subjects under study or multiple conditions, you use multiple colors in order to represent that. So these are your basics of graphing in science. Please follow the rules with every assignment and don't risk getting docked points by you know, having a sloppy product when you're done. Have pride in your work and make these graphs uh, fit the rules. I'll talk to you next time. See ya.